Awesome. OK, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming along. My name is Arne Wieberg. I'm from the CERN cloud team. And today, I'm going to summarize a little bit uh, what we have done in the past uh, weeks and months in order to prepare Manila and CephFS for production at CERN. Um, the Ceph service um, is not run by the OpenSec team itself, so I was working closely with my colleague, colleague uh, Dan in order to put together the material for, for this presentation. Before we talk about um, Manila and CephFS, I would like to briefly um, introduce CERN for those of you who would like to know a little bit more what that is. So CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Um, it was founded in 1954 and has, at the moment, 22 member states. Um, the acronym CERN, however, is very often also used for the laboratory itself. So it's the uh, largest, uh, the world's largest uh, laboratory, particle physics laboratory. It's located at the border between, between Switzerland and France. There are about um, 2,300 uh, people working there, serving 12,500 users. And we have a budget of roughly 1 billion Swiss francs per year in order to um, follow our primary mission, which is to find answers to some of the fundamental questions of the universe. So questions like, what is matter composed of? Um, what happened right after the Big Bang? Why is there an asymmetry between matter and antimatter, and so on? In order to do this, um, we have a tool, which is the Large Hadron Collider. So it's a particle physics um, or a particle collider that's built underground in a tunnel that's like 100 meters, roughly, underground. You can see a schematic of this on the picture. So here you lo look actually from the French side, from the French mountains, onto Geneva and the Lake of Geneva. Um, you see the dotted line is the, the border between the two countries. And you see the, where the accelerator is, roughly. So the accelerator has uh, um, basically two beam pipes where particles are circulating before they collide. So the circumference of this is roughly 27 kilometers. And there's a lot of things to say about this uh, machine and what it all can do. One number that I find particularly impressive is that the particles, before they are collided, they are accelerated and they do the 27 kilometers 11,000 times per second. OK, so they are very close to the speed of light. It's very high energy. They collide it. And then at the interaction points, we have detectors that actually record what's, what's happening. And then the data is analyzed and understand, understand the, the corresponding physics. I don't have time to talk about this very much. If you're interested, I um, invite you to visit um, our homepage, where you find a lot more information about this, home.cern. Um, at CERN, we, have, we run an OpenStack cloud um, since July 2013. Uh, we have, of course, upgraded the cloud several times. We're currently mostly on Newton for most of the components. The cloud spans two data centers. So we have one which is located at the, at the main site, which you just saw in Geneva. And then we have a second data center in, in Hungary, 23 milliseconds away. We do this by having only one region in order to provide one API. So for the users, it's, it's mostly transparent, actually. The cloud has, our cloud has, at the moment, 220,000 cores. Um, we will add another 80,000, roughly, in the coming weeks. So it's a little bit bigger. So we hope to like just cross 300,000 cores. Um, this is done on 7,000 hypervisors that we that we manage, and the additional cores will come with the additional 2,000 hypervisors. At the moment, we have um, 27,000 VMs running in that cloud. In order to get to this scale, we are heavy users of cells, so cells version 1. We have more than 50 cells where, where the, the various um, hypervisors are organized. And we use this also in order to separate the different types of hardware that we have, different use cases, so services versus, versus compute use cases. There are different uh, cells that support um, the power feeds that are different, the two locations, and so on. So this is very briefly, in one slide, our, our cloud. Now, as this is about storage. CERN does a lot of things in storage. So also here, I cannot talk about all the different storage systems that we have. Um, we have basically everything from tape robots over disks to, to, to SSDs in order to um, help our users to, to, to achieve their whatever they were trying to do. Um, the flagship project or the flagship storage system that we have at the moment, it's an in-house development. It's called EOS. That's mostly used for data analysis which stores uh, or has a capacity at the moment of 120 petabytes on 44,000 spinning drives. 
What we're going to talk about, though, is um, this area. So we have Ceph um, as the main or as the back end for, for Cinder. Um, and um, in addition, we have something which we call the NFS filer service, where we have NFS users, so users that cannot use one of the other storage systems, that require NFS access to, to, to the data. And we're going to focus on, on these two. Now, the NFS filer service is, um, is also based on OpenStack in the end. So it's NFS appliances. So we have multiple VMs that attach a volume, um, use um, um, ZFS as the file system, and then uh, it's exported, exported to users. Um, the second data center is used for, for ZFS replication for disaster recovery. We use local SSDs as, a, as an accelerator for the H2 arc or the, the ZFS intent log. And as I said, this is for users that need strong um, consistency and POSIX access to, to a storage system. So we have users on there like Puppet or GitLab um, and various other um, applications. This service, however, has some limitations. So there's a, uh, if you have a single NFS server, as we have for, for, for these use cases, um, there's some limitations that you hit, um, like the metadata operations. So this is, for instance, a plot um, of the metadata operations. So you see that it's like 20,000, and then there's a bump. This is, we believe, when we upgraded from Puppet 3 to Puppet 4. So Puppet is one of the main users of this. Um, another limitation that we have is the availability, because if you have a single VM that has a single volume mounted and there's something wrong, you may have issues with that um, with ac access to storage. And what the users really ask for, very often ask for, is some kind of shared block device that is available on multiple, on multiple instances. And in addition, we have emerging use cases, um, which are HPC use cases, where I have an extra slide for this. So this is mostly, this is not our core um, so this is not in, in the core data analysis um, uh, data path or, or workflows, but this is where we do beam simulations, um, accelerator physics to understand how the machine works and how it needs to be tuned, plus some simulation um, QCD, so quantum chromodynamics. So the theorists are working with, with MPI applications in order to do their, their computations. And as I said, that's slightly different from the usual HTC models, so the high throughput computing that we do where we shuffle the data in, in, uh, through uh, a batch system in order to analyze this. So it's really high performance um, computing where we need a low latency clusters. We have dedicated clusters for this. We have um, the need for systems that can support jobs that run for four or eight weeks. And these applications need access to shared storage, for instance, in order to store their temporary state. Um, and this is now what, what NFS can support in our, in our environment. So what we did last year, middle of last year, we set up a dedicated CephFS cluster for this. It's relatively small with 150 terabytes. It's also relatively low activity, but it was the first try to actually get CephFS into, into CERN and to see if CephFS could actually address the need for a distributed shared file system. Now, the question that we had is, like, can we converge these two use cases that we have, so the, the HPC use case and the NFS use case, into both onto CephFS and basically get rid of the, of the NFS file service to consolidate things a little bit? And if yes, how do we make this available to the user? So how can we manage uh, users that want, want to share here or share there so it's not possible that we do this by email or something? Okay, so this is why we're looking into, into CephFS um, and Manila. I will start with the, with the CephFS backend. So very briefly, for those of you who don't know what CephFS is, so CephFS is, the, is a POSIX-compliant shell file system that's on top of the, of the Ceph um, Rados layer. So it's the same foundation as RBD, which we already use at CERN since multiple years, so we know that it's working and very reliable. There are user land and kernel clients available for, for, for CephFS where the user client usually gets like features first and then they go into the into the kernel client to the kernel client later. The current production release is um, Jewel. So in Jewel, CephFS was tagged as production ready and the main addition at the time was a file system check that would allow an operator or a, uh, a manager of the system to actually detect if there's something inconsistent in the file system. So it was well, almost awesome before, but the focus was more on, on uh, block and an object to get these foundations rock solid, and then now the focus is also on self-affairs. 
Now, the, the main addition that comes when you um, go to CephFS is the CephFS metadata server. So as I said, we already know that the foundation works, um, but the, the MDS now becomes the, the crucial component to build a fast and, and scalable file system. So um, the metadata server basically does two things. It creates and manages the inodes, which are then persisted in the underlying uh, object store, but they are cached in memory, and it tracks the client inode capabilities, so which client is using which, which inode. So if you have a larger cache on your MDS, um, this can help with your, your metadata speed up, and uh, more RAM on the MDS can avoid that you have to wait uh, when you have to read in um, metadata from radars. However, if you have like a single MDS, of course, at some point this becomes, this becomes an issue, this becomes a bottleneck. Um, so we needed, or we need, multiple MDSs for, for, for scaling. Um, it's maybe interesting to know that, that the MDS itself keeps nothing on, in disk, so having like SSDs on the MDS doesn't really help with, with uh, anything, but if you have a flash-based writer's pool, um, that may help with metadata and sensitive workloads. So the, the testing that we have done with MDS is uh, like very simple, basic checks like POSIX compliance. So we used the Tuxera POSIX test suite for this. It came out OK. Um, that my colleague Dan has written a, a tool very similar to Ping that checked the, um, something like a, um, the consistency, consistency delays that you see when you have two clients. Um, it's like ping with the file system in between, if you like, so that seems okay as well. We've seen some slowdowns that we can reproduce if we have multiple clients writing to the same, to the same area where we're in touch with upstream to understand what that is. Now, in order to understand if this can actually do what we want, is we try to mimic what the Puppet Master does. So if you remember, the Puppet Master is one of the main users that we have on NFS. So we basically um, took a copy of the current um, files that the Puppet Master has, has and basically run a massive find from one or multiple clients on this. And what we saw is that we hit a limit at roughly 20,000 uh, stats um, per second, which is enough for what we need, if you remember this, the, the graph that I for showed before, but it's just, just okay. So for this, we also need to, to scale out a little bit more. Um, the other thing we tried is like having um, tried the failover. So if you have like a second MDS and you want to failover um, with this, uh, also with multiple active, active MDSs than with Luminous re um, release, um, this all seems to be okay. So from our testing, it's, it's all fine. The only thing that we found is like when you have like uh, data that is accessed that may move around between the MDSs where you would expect that it, it stays there, but also there we're in, we're in touch with upstream to understand what's happening there. So we have found a couple of issues with CephFS. Uh, I won't go through them through all of them. You see already that most of them have been already addressed. Um, two things that probably we would need um, are in the areas of quotas. So at the moment, there are no, uh, there's no quota enforcement in the kernel client. And on the Fuse client, quotas are basically advisory or like you need to have basically uh, clients that behave in order to not fill up your cluster or, circum or bypass the, the, the quotas that you have. The other thing is, um, some throttling or QoS, which allows us actually to protect the cluster in case there, um, there's a user that launches uh, a batch job with 10,000 clients that then start to hammer CFFS and no one else can get access to the, to the system. So these are the two, two things that we see we would need, but in principle, it passed all our testing. It, it works where we are. So uh, CFFS is awesome. The POSIX compliant looks very good. In months of testing, so we have the, as I said, this HPC use case on there since middle of last year. It actually, we didn't have any issues with this. Uh, no difficult issues, at least. Um, quotas and QS I mentioned. Um, with the single MDS that we have it now, it's good enough for our use case, uh, but we will need multi-MDS, and this, as uh, if you've been to Sage's talk earlier, this will, this will come with the Luminous release, and we are already testing this. What we haven't looked at yet is, is backup. So how do we actually uh, back, back it up? Uh, or an, an NFS re-exports um, re for our legacy clients or for clients that need Kerberos. As I said, Luminous testing has, has started. So CephFS is working very well for us. The second part is like how we, do we integrate this now um, in our OpenStack deployment and how, we, how do we hand file shares out to the users? 
And um, this is why we started looking into Manila. Now, before I talk about what we did with Manila, um, you may have seen in the news in end of April last year that the LHC was sh suddenly shut down. Um, and this is the, the front page uh, on the website of Le Monde, which says that a fuin has caused the LHC to shut down. Now, a fuin is the French term for wiesel. Okay, so it's this. <laughs> so what happened actually is that this wiesel got into one of the electrical power stations and caused an emergency shutdown of the largest machine that mankind has ever built. Okay, so. Now, you can imagine that when I started with Manila and I started with a project that has this as a, <laughs> as a mascot, you can imagine what kind of jokes I got, right? So, so uh, whether I'm trying to like shut down a whole of IT, and, yeah. You will see how close they came to the truth in a second. So for the Manila overview, for those of you who, who, who don't really know what Manila is, so Manila is the file share project in OpenStack. It allows to provision file shares to virtual machines. It's like Cinder for file shares or Cinder for NFS. So it's very similar to, to, to this concept. Um, clients or tenants can request shares um, to be created. These will then be created by backend drivers. And then the client can access such a share from, from, from an instance, mounted and access it from there. There's support for a variety of protocols. For us, it was, of course, relevant that CephFS is, is supported. Uh, and also, it supports the sh notion of shared types. So we can have different types of shares, which allows you to map things to different backends, which is also something that we heavily use in, in Cinder, for instance. Roughly, the service looks like this, or the components in the service look like this. So you have an API component that receives uh, requests of just the authentication and then handles the request in general. You have the scheduler that routes the request to the appropriate uh, share service. And you have this share service at the back with the driver that actually manages the, the shares themselves, creates them, deletes them, and so on. In addition, you have a message queue to allow for the communication between the components, and you have a database where uh, as usual, the, the metadata information is stored. So it's not complete. So the Manila data service I have omitted because we, we didn't use this. So when we started doing this, <clears throat> actually, it's, it's pretty convenient if you already have a cloud. So um, what I did is I created three virtual machines. I started the, the API the schedule and the share daemon on all of them. Um, I had a separate rabbit cluster for which we have puppet modules ready for all the other components that you saw earlier in the list. So this is all more or less automated. We have a service that provides you a database. So actually, what did I do? You know, I didn't do very much. Um, and we used the existing CephFS backend. So um, if you deduce the time I needed to set up Rabbit, which is, as I said, Puppet and request the database or so, we had something working in less than one hour. It was really, really easy to set this up. Well, I say working because some of you may notice that we have now three VMs and all of them run a share service, which is not what you can do. And we found out pretty quickly because the CephFS driver actually, when it's launched, it will evict all the other clients that try to use with the, uh, with the same authentication identifier. Um, so we were wondering why always, there's always only one. And well, you know, I was immediately talking to upstream and I thought they found a bug, but the bug was actually me. Because so the way it should run is like this. So you should have. Um, only one share service that's talking to your backend. Now, funnily enough, I put this very small here. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, I also changed our Cinder setup, which was following the same wrong approach. I had multiple volume services that were talking to Cinder and could also lead to, to some issues. Then, once we had the setup, <clears throat> we started testing. So the first thing we did is like we created and deleted shares, okay? Um, sequentially, very slowly, Looked all good. It takes a couple of seconds to create a share. Deletion is a little bit longer. One of the things I saw that I haven't followed up yet is that there are like more authentication calls that I would think there are, but um, that all works. Next thing I did is what bulk deletion of shares. So if you have like many shares and you want to delete all of them, um, you can either do this sequentially. So you go like Manila delete A, B, C, and so on. That works, but you can also do this in parallel. So you can say Manila delete A, B, C, D, and just spawn it off and say, like, okay, delete all these shares. Uh, and it both works. So how get, did I come up with this test? 
the thing is that we have an issue with Cinder, for instance, where when you do this, our Cinder basically has issues. And this is what users really do when, for instance, they have a Magnum cluster with 50 nodes, and all of them have a volume attached, and then you delete a Magnum cluster, and it goes to heat, and heat says, okay, delete this cluster. It basically launches this, and this affects our production service. So Manila did fine. Um, when trying to de debug this on, on Cinder, I was actually looking at the code. It looks very similar to me, so I'm not really sure why it, that doesn't work on Cinder yet. Okay, so after I have done these very simple tests and done this for 24 hours in a loop, like uh, creation, deletion all the time, and it all worked fine, I thought we can get a little bit more serious. So the next thing I did is I started something that is called the Fween Hammer, okay? Remember, Fween is the, the, the name, French name for visa. So I used, um, with the help of my colleagues, to um, set up with our Magnum deployment a Kubernetes cluster, okay? And then in this Kubernetes cluster, I had pods, and these pods would actually try to talk to Manila, okay? For instance, Manila list as a simple example. So this is the, the, the Fween Hammer. And then I tried to scale things in order to, to break it. So this, this was the idea. So to just give you an idea how that works or how that looked like, I hope you can see this. You don't have to read. It's just, so on the left-hand side, you see like three tails of the Manila API servers, so the three servers that I have. And then on the right-hand side, I will now create a Kubernetes cluster. So you see kubectl, there's one part at the moment. And then you see, so there's Manila list in the loop, and you see how the APIs start to like work. And then there's a, a nice tool that's called kubetail on the right-hand side that actually gets the output from the pods and says what it sees. Okay, that's all very fine. It's all nice. I should probably stop that for a second. So, oops. Yikes. Okay. All right, that's the run. So, so the main point here is like, once you have this all in set up with Kubernetes, it's very easy to scale it, okay? And very dangerous. So what happened is that, we're now at the point again where you see the output from this pod in the top right terminal, and it says Manila list, there's one share, and it does that as fast as it can. Now in the bottom right corner, I open the the YAML file that describes the deployment, and I go from one pod to 10 pods. Right? That takes me two seconds. So it's really a sharp knife. And you will see that the APIs get more busy suddenly because now there are 10 pods, okay? And then on the top right corner, you see like color-coded the different pods and what they actually do. So you can imagine what happened next, right? So if you can do one and you can do 10, you can do 10,000, right? So. <laughs> You cannot. <laughs> okay, I will come back to this later. Okay, so here's basically what I saw. So when you scale the number of parts, and this is the, the number of requests, so it's trying to stress the APIs and see where they break, basically. So if you, in the small graph, you basically see zoomed in the, the area on the very left. So you basically see it scales linear with the number of API servers. So I had three nodes, four cores, each one API, so it's 12. So up to 12, it basically scales linearly, and then it kind of stops, which is kind of what I would expect. So that looks okay. Um, the pod can, of, do, of course, do more complicated things rather than lists that can create and delete. So I had each pod was creating and deleting all the time, and then you create a lot of, a lot of pods. And this is how it looked like in our, in our dashboard. So what you see here is um, basically, so I had one pod, 10 pod, 100 pods, then I went for lunch, made it back to 10 so that I don't disturb anyone, and then I went to 1,000, and you see like how the request time is affected depending on how many clients are actually talking to Manila. So you, you see, notice if you have 100 pods trying to like query the API in parallel, and the request time goes through the roof if you really, really scale it out. And if you really exaggerate, you see something on the bottom, it's like the number of errors that you see in the, in the logs when it basically hits limits like the database connections. Okay, so works fine. We don't have, I don't know, 10,000 clients that try to create shares at the same time. From our experience with Cinder, you have like one every couple of seconds or something. So it's, it, it looks very fine. I couldn't break it. I was a little bit disappointed, I, but it, it, it just works. Now, not everything works. So uh, the Fween Hammer actually uh, 
created some trouble in other places. So um, right away, when I created this Kubernetes cluster, I was, okay, where's my first Kubernetes cluster, okay? So I, create, I thought I could just do it with 500 nodes. And then we have an internal chat system, and I could see that someone posted, like, the registry is down. <laughs> and I was, I, was thinking, I was thinking, oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> and then it's like, flush. <laughs> it's like, okay. So, yeah, I, said, I put something on the chat saying, yeah, that's probably me. So the colleagues were very kind, actually. So that was right away I broke it. But then if you like scale further, you hit other issues like, like the DNS. So the DNS needed to be scaled to so the DNS within Kubernetes. Um, at some point, the amount of monitoring that you create over flooded our, our Elasticsearch um, system. And also there, I didn't realize it was me. It was pretty funny for like several days, I was complaining to them that this doesn't work, whatever. So was that because I tried to create these graphs and see this all in the dashboard, but the dashboard was empty because there was no data and there was no data because I broke it. Okay. so, so <laughs> like a hand and neck problem. And then like when, when you have a couple of thousand parts, at some point you hit um, DB connection errors on the DB side where they limit how many clients can actually connect. So it's, um, you of course then see, say, see errors in Manila, but it's not Manila itself, it's just the, um, the, the, the database backend. Okay, <clears throat> so in the end, what we have now is a, a kind of pre-production setup with these three controllers still. Um, we have three backends all on Ceph in different, um, uh, different um, releases and for different purposes. So we have a production cluster where we have the HPC use case, which we created their share through Manila now. We have a test um, backend where users come and test um, Manila if that works for them in CephFS. And then we have a dev cluster where we test, test Luminous at the moment. So this is basically what we have at the moment and, and that seems to be working. Okay, now one of the first users that we have actually on top of, of HPC is one of the experiments. So, so they are actually using this. They have um, built an infrastructure which allows them to dynamically um, put together an analysis chain depending on the outcome of um, calculations that they do and, and data they analyze. So they do this as um, directed graphs directive graphs without, without cycles, which are built at runtime, okay? Um, and the, the individual graph nodes are containers. Um, so I'm not really an expert, an expert in this. In the end, what they use is they use Kubernetes and, uh, and uh, Magnum and Kubernetes in order to put this all together. And they're using CephFS to store the intermediate share um, stages of the jobs, okay? So they have all these, these, these containers and then they have this shared space where they basically store things. So that's working very well and it's working very well also because it leverages the, the integration that you have uh, of CephFS and, and Kubernetes, which is, which is really nice. So there was basically nothing for us really to do because it's all there. Okay. So, so to conclude on, on Manila, Manila is also awesome. Okay. It's, it, it's working very well. The setup is, is really, really easy. Um, we, we didn't find any major issues. Uh, we tried some functional testing, um, key generation, creation, deletion of, of everything. Um, that worked all okay. Um, some of the features that we found were missing. We, we talked to upstream, uh, like quotas that you have per share type so that you actually can control that a tenant can create only so and so much or take up only so and so much space on a specific backend rather than having a global quota and you can't control where that uses and space is actually used up. Um, and some of the other features, like having really multiple um, share services are in the plans at least. Uh, also, we're very interested in the, in the NFS, the CephFS NFS driver to actually have something that re-exports CephFS as NFS because some of our users would like to have um, NFS because this is something they, they know it's, it's, it's available everywhere. There may be issues with, with licensing and, and, and warranties and so on. So that's something we're very interested in. Um, there's some issues that I think need a little bit more intention. So for instance, the client integration, because what we have, so um, our users, we try to like move them to the OpenStack client. So we say, don't use Nova, don't use Cinder directly anymore, use the OpenStack client. But then if you have a new project that you're trying to uh, get users used to, and then you have to tell them, okay, for this project, you have to use a container or special machines where you use this, that's 
giving the wrong impression of the state of the project, I think. So that would be, would be really nice. There's some minor issues that we found where you can do things on the UI. You can th do things on the CLI that you can't do on the UI that may be also confusing for, for users. Um, one thing that's maybe specific for CephFS is that with the last share that you delete, your author ID also goes away. Yeah, that can be easily fixed. I'm not sure how, how much users like this or not. And what I really would like to f point out that um, the, the Manila team was really, really helpful with like, uh, helping and understanding how that all works and uh, helpful with adding features that, that we needed. So it's really a nice, helpful team that's very much appreciated. And I'm basically done um, with the look at the, of a dashboard um, that we have. So this is the dashboard of the production Manila instance that we have. It's still pretty small, and there's just artificial load at the moment, but uh, um, this is basically how, how I check that everything is fine in Manila. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So the CFFS test cluster that you talked about in the beginning of your presentation, I'm assuming that you used uh, XFS as a file store, or did you venture out into the BlueFS land? No, 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 it's XFS. And uh, did you do any testing with respect to RDMA, or was it all no. just TCP IP? Yeah. So for luminous testing that you have planned for future, uh, do you plan on testing some RDMA capabilities? Um, actually, I'm not the chef expert in that respect, so I, I'm not really sure if, uh, what he really plans. I was chatting to him when, during, during Sage's, Sage's talk, about Blue Store and how we introduced this. Um, and he's very interested to like, get this into our, into our cluster. Um, but for RDMA, uh, I don't think so. OK, thank you. So, so, so the question is, I'm very interested in, in uh, NFS as, as a re-export for CFFS, so how do the clients connect at the moment? So at the moment, the clients use, it depends, this, like, as I said, there's a kernel client and a user land client. So the Kubernetes clients at the moment that we have use the kernel client. Everyone else, we ask to use CephFuse in order to connect. Okay, so we have a description of how to do this manually, and we have also something in Puppet that actually just allows the user to say, okay, this is the, the volume path, and we have a secret store where, we, where the user has to upload the key, the authentication, the key, the CephFX key with his authentication identifier, where it's basically pulled from, from the Puppet module, and then with the information that the user gives for the volume, and it's, well, it's like four lines in the Puppet manifest that will allow a user to actually integrate this, and this is also then CephFuse. So we're a little bit worried about the, the quota issue, really, because if you have no quotas and uh, you have a client that runs off at 3 a.m. just filling the cluster, this is something that is, yeah, something we're worried about. So this is why we're asking Ceph, for Ceph Fuse and then for, the, for uh, actually respecting the quotas. Uh, about the, the clients, do they have to talk directly to the OSDs for their data? <coughs> Sorry, so do you have to open up the OSDs to the clients? All right. The way to the clients. Yes. So, so, yeah. So, with CephFS, of course, you have, you have to like, kind of trust your users. So, the clients basically are on the same network as, uh, as the Ceph cluster. That's the question. So, how, how important are mandatory quotas versus just having quota support in the kernel? In other words, the fact that they're, you, you rely on the client to cooperate. Uh, I mean, you don't have malicious users, presumably. You might have users that make mistakes, but they're not going to change out the CephFS right. use client, right? Yeah. So I, I was curious on the slide you had. To, as, as somebody thinks about this, you know, working on this, um, it, seemed, it seemed to me offhand that uh, the issue of uh, the uh, Fuse client being cooperative was right. less important. Well, for, for us, it's basically, I mean, for, for us, having no quarters in the kernel client stops us a little bit from telling Kubernetes users to use CephFS, right? 
So this is a little, little bit of an issue. I mean, usually we don't have malicious users, as you say. So it shouldn't be an issue. And we also try to compartmentalize things. So if someone goes crazy here, it shouldn't affect everything else. So it's, for instance, in different Ceph instances, in different pools, and so on. So, but yeah, it's something that, like from an operational point, we would really like to have coders. Any more questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much.